Hello everyone out there. Welcome to Creating the World We Want, a video podcast aimed to articulate opportunities to enhance our civic systems and build there to create the world we want together. Today we have an amazing guest, David Delmar, founder of Resilient Coders. And he has a very interesting background as not only a coder, a designer, an activist, and founded Resilient Coders in 2014. Before that, he worked at PayPal to help bigger brands develop their design perspective, but also had a great you know, startup relationship with many brands there, too. Um, and he has gone through a lot at Boston University to receive your graphic design degree and is now a thought leader here in Boston trying to help advance economic mobility, specifically with Resilient Coders, who, which is a nonprofit training boot camp, highly competitive, that is serving people of color here in Boston. So to start us off here, I would like to kind of dive back into your background a little bit and just initially ask what in your youth helped ground you to become the person you are today? Well, I mean, I would say that my parents had played a really big role in um, influencing who I am today. Uh, a big part of it was having or having grown up in a Spanish-speaking household. Uh, I grew up with Mexican culture being sort of a big part of um, who we are, you know, how, how I comport myself. And um, my parents, particularly my mother, happened to be very uh, tough people who value resilience. Um, my mother once said to me something that I now repeat often to our students, uh, which is, you know, the good thing about getting kicked in the butt is that when you fall, you fall forward. <laughs> and so that was sort of the uh, environment that I grew up in. And did, did you live in Mexico City, or what was the connection to Mexico? So I was born here. I'm the first in my family born here. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents had uh, come over shortly beforehand. Mm -hmm. I actually have Mexican citizenship mm -hmm. because the plan was to go back, mm -hmm. um, which never quite materialized. Mm -hmm. And growing up, we used to go back to Mexico City as mm -hmm. often as possible. And so I grew up with my cousins being among my best friends. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And um, tell us a little bit more. Uh, we had the opportunity to speak before. Uh, you seem to have lived in two worlds. You, uh, I think, uh, had this deep Latino roots and identity, and yet also I think people often assume that you were white. Uh, how did that play out in your childhood and your schooling? Well, it's interesting. I had never really felt Latino, right, whatever that means, mm -hmm. um, until I was an adult. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not to say that I wasn't immersed in that culture. I absolutely was. It's the language, the food, the, um, you know, everything that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. Um, but it didn't occur to me as a, as a dichotomy uh, until I was an adult and I was working in tech and realized that maybe this is something that is different and other um, than what is kind of mainstream out there. Mm -hmm. Could you just tell us crisply, what is re uh, Resilient Coders exactly and, and why is it so important? Yeah, Resilient Coders is, as Tom was mentioning earlier, it's a highly competitive, nonprofit, stipended coding boot camp. Mm -hmm. and what we do is we train individuals, people of color from traditionally low income backgrounds, mm -hmm. and we make them software engineers. We connect them with employers and we give them that push into that first job as software engineers. Mm -hmm. And we do this not because we're uh, in love with technology, which of course we also are. Mm -hmm. um, but the real why as to why we do it is about building economic resiliency in, among communities that have his, historically been more economically vulnerable. So diving a little bit into the aha moment of why you found it resilient, you know, what did you see going on out there that caused you to realize this needs to be done, this needs to happen here in Boston? Yeah, well, you know, it started with a, with a diversity thing. Uh, I wouldn't say that Resilient Coders is necessarily about diversity today as much as it is about equitable access to the economy. Um, but it started there. Uh, it, I started realizing this otherness that I was mentioning earlier, that there are not a lot of Latinos working in tech. I, as, as I mentioned to you yesterday, I had a moment in tech where I'm at these big conferences, seeing what the best and the brightest are up to, mm -hmm. and I'm looking around me. I'm thinking, where's mi gente? You know what I mean? Where, where, where are the Spanish speakers? Where are the people of color? Uh, and I started peeling back layers of the onion. And when you start peeling back layers of the onion in Boston, there's just, there's just a lot there. Uh, and when this whole thing began in 2014, I came back from one such conference and I thought, I don't know what I'm gonna do about this, but I have to do something. And so where Resilient Coders began is I was just volunteering my time 
I would take a vacation day, one day a week, and I'd go down to a, a youth detention facility, a DYS center, and teach um, some young men to code, some HTML, some CSS, and see how it went. And what I found was, first of all, it was, it was a phenomenal experience, and these boys were really hungry to learn. But on the other side of it, I was trying to hire at PayPal. And when you get a stack of resumes, you have a sense for somebody's technical aptitude, but you know what you don't know is who are you? Who are you? And there I am at this facility, and I'm meeting these boys who are getting it and who love it. And I'm thinking, oh my God, you are who I want to hire. You have everything that I'm looking for. You have that grit. You have that tenacity. You have that aggressive constitution. You want to find a solution, right? When stuff goes down at 2 o'clock in the morning, right, who, who do I want next to me? I want one of these boys. Mm -hmm. And I started realizing that what separates, the, what separates these young men from their candidacy um, for, uh, for a role on my team at PayPal is just the coding skills, the technical aptitude, which given a couple months and some coffee, we can get there. Mm -hmm. So as long as I can provide those things, we can totally scale this up and rethink workforce in Boston. Well, let me go into that a little bit more. So one of the things I found reading about you that was so interesting is that uh, on the one hand, we have this dynamic tech industry where so many things are happening and where people are excited about being creative and where people believe that there's no barrier, that anybody can do this, and it's all based on a meritocracy. And yet, what you were starting to say there is that, in fact, uh, it's not just about meritocracy. There are other things that either permit you or prevent you from moving forward. And I think your willingness to name that and address that is one of the most interesting things. So could you, could you uh, help us understand your thinking about that essentially failure of meritocracy right in the middle of a community that they think it exemplifies it? Right. Well. Absolutely. Um, I have a couple of answers. I'll start very briefly by saying that everybody should read a report done by Boston Indicators recently, mm -hmm. in case people want to nerd out on this. Mm -hmm. If they just Google, Boston is booming, but for whom? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really enlightening report that basically says, yes, we have this historic unemployment rate, um, but who is really benefiting from this economic boom and who is not? Mm -hmm. One thing that I love about my people, and by my people I mean technical people, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, is that we're all about the data. So for those who are, Boston is booming, but for whom? Look it up. Now, in terms of more sort of qualitative data that I have picked up, there are many, many factors that lead to some people having one step forward and other folks having one step back mm -hmm. when it comes to pursuing high growth careers in technology. Uh, and it's, it's really hard to pull one thread out, but it's, it's enmeshed with you know, uh, how we hire, it's enmeshed in um, the expectations that we have of candidates when they approach a job. One example of this is it's, it's, very, it's very common in tech for someone to say, if you have taught yourself to code, then you are who I want. Like if you taught yourself to code, you are a leader in the field. This is an, exem uh, an self example self-starter. You're a self-starter. Yeah. But here's the thing. Mm -hmm. People can teach themselves to code when they don't have to worry where their next meal is coming from. When you got to work two to three jobs, you're not going to sit there from 1 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the morning, which is when you're off, teaching yourself React. That's crazy. And so what we're doing is that when we expect people to have a mastery of skills that they have no chance of learning in college or in high school, you are gearing your search towards those who have the privilege of time. And sadly, not everybody has privilege of time, so we have to think differently about that point of access. In your most recent speech at the Resilient Coder Demo Day, which I thought was one of the best speeches I've ever heard, Thank you. you referenced the need to create a new system because the system we've created is actually really good at what it does, is giving people who have access opportunities to grow up and get other opportunities in the tech field. And those who don't have access, they're left behind, which is not the system we here want to build. And I don't think to get th together as humanity, it's acceptable. Um, could you dive into you know, the system you see now, too, you know, some of the studies you referenced, but also you know, what would that other system look like that you're, you're touching on upon now? Well, if there's one thing that I, we can all say about American capitalism is that privilege begets privilege. I mean, that's, that's the way the system was designed, has always been, and, for, and probably forever shall be. Right? 
And so there are a couple of different buckets through which we can see this play out over and over and over again. Um, two of the easiest ones to call out are um, property ownership, right? Like who, who has historically had access to mortgages and, and home buying, right? And the other one that's also worth talking about is education. Um, the Economist, a couple, of weeks, a couple um, months ago, The Economist put out a study called um, The Strange Failure of the Educated Elite. That's another one for the nerds to look up. Um, and it basically says that education has now been one of the ways in which we are able to inherit privilege from our parents. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is one of those uh, dynamics social dynamics that we will have to disrupt if we expect to institute some level of meritocracy in the tech workforce. Real meritocracy. Real meritocracy, thank you, right. yes. Yeah, yep. yeah. Uh, and uh, so this also ties into what kind of degree uh, people expect you to have. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> Look, we're all, I like to say that we're all mammals, right? And one of the things that mammals do is they like to congregate around like similar mammals, right? We're, we're creatures of pack, right? Uh, and this so, is explaining a lot of things about my own behavior. <laughs> <laughs> we all have a propensity to want to be around people who laugh at our jokes, who watch our movies, mm -hmm. who listen to our music, mm -hmm. uh, who dress the way we do, and who have similar values. That's, that's biology. Um, and so that plays out in our hiring practices too. And we have all kinds of biases towards people who put us at ease. And one of the ways in which people put us at ease is they're just like us. We see ourselves in them. We have a propensity to hire ourselves over and over and over again. One of the ways in which this plays out in a way that is sort of legally acceptable is that we look at college as a proxy for a bucket for other skills that we are supposed to have learned in college. I certainly didn't learn professionalism in college. I learned a lot of things, but how to comport myself as a professional was not one. Mm -hmm. um, I learned that uh, on some of my first jobs, right? And so one of the things that I would like to see come out of the tech community over the next couple of years is the removal of the BA requirement for jobs that empirically do not require a BA. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the big tech companies like Apple, Google, Microsoft have actually removed the BA requirement from a lot of their technical positions, including software engineering. You do not need a computer science and en en uh, engineering degree mm -hmm. um, to, be a com to be a software engineer. And so that's part of the broader culture shift that we need to push towards if we're going to have equitable employment practices. But just to go, so what you're saying is you don't, in fact, need it to do that, that's but correct. people still expect you to have that as a way of sorting applications really quickly, or as you said, being a proxy for other forms of training, and I suppose also being a proxy for similarity, because correct. you know I had this background and. Look at you, you have that background too. I totally support that, um, and I'm drawn to that. How does that then, uh, how have you been able to help people understand that diversity uh, across so many different categories is in fact a great strength rather than the safety of similarity? Uh, another thing that I'll say about my people, and by people I mean technical folks, yeah. is they just wanna see the proof. Yeah. Uh, and so it's incumbent on me to connect people um, with the talent so they can actually see the code, talk to the engineer, get a sense for the way that they think. Mm -hmm. And honestly, the students and our graduates, they sell themselves. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's, I have to just take two steps back and let that matchmaking happen naturally because they just take it from there. Can you describe some of the students you've had and maybe a little bit about their backgrounds and Abs absolutely. or their outcomes? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Um, so the outcomes are, are very simple. We exist as a workforce training program. We're essentially a vocational track, mm -hmm. and so we're just concerned with job placement. Um, about 74% of our graduates right now are getting placed in the full-time roles as software engineers uh, at companies like Wayfair, and as well as sort of smaller tech startups. Um, now, in terms of who comes in the door, we're very, very intentional with who that is. Mm -hmm. We have to think creatively around how we bring people in if we're not using sort of assessments and college degrees as these proxies. Mm -hmm. um, the commonality that we look for is resilience. And I know it sounds super cheesy, but when you get to meet these individuals, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, an example that I always throw out there is I had a young man come by he had hopped in his car in Houston, Texas, and he drove up here when he heard that Boston was the Silicon Valley of the East. And when I asked him, all right, you know, why should we let you into the program? He basically said, I don't care if you let me into the program or not. 
I'm teaching myself to code. Mm -hmm. That's who we want. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a young woman here who was uh, displaced from Syria, mm -hmm. right? And she created sort of like a, almost like a refugee Craigslist where individuals could find each other, share, collaborate. Mm -hmm. People have this incredible why within them mm -hmm. that is very easy to see. And so at that point, all we have to do is arm them with the actual hard technical skills that will allow them to build out their why, whether it's that explicit task that they set out to do or just the general ethos that they contribute to the culture. Mm -hmm. And so when we, can, when we can celebrate and elevate individuals like those and make them a part of the tech community, I believe the tech community will be irre irrevocably changed thanks to them. It's, it's very inspiring to meet your, the people who have gone through your program. It, they, you're right, the aura of grit and resilience shines through them every day. It's amazing. Incredible people. Um, going back into the report that you referenced in your speech that Boston is one of the most unequal cities out there, um, I kind of am curious why you think that's developed here. You know, we have a mindset that we are progressive to a degree, that we are pushing forward society, that we're, we're leaders. Massachusetts has always been ideally that beacon on the hill to the rest of the country. And we have led in the past on certain issues, but I'm very fearful that we're falling behind and not taking the necessary leadership. We are more managing the situation than leading. Can you address that report uh, that you reference in your speech and just why Boston has developed this unequal ranking and maybe a strategy or two on how we can push forward? Yeah, I, there, are, there are several reasons as to why we have become a city of two Bostons. Um, and when I say a city of two Bostons, I mean that there are two, at least, right, at least two distinct communities that have unfortunately very little connectivity in sort of a professional context. Uh, I mean, I have a friend that called it out that when you're out you know, eating dinner, grabbing a bite over in Cambridge, if you just like look around you at your restaurant, most of the people there are gonna look like you. And ditto Fields Corner, right? Like it's, there are two communities that aren't necessarily talking to each other. There are many reasons for which this continues to be uh, a dynamic that we live with. One of the ones that I would like to call out and uh, lose a whole bunch of friends immediately is that this is the land of the illustrious four-year institution. And so what happens is that folks, including myself, come from away, and they come here to study, and they stay. And we have a very well-oiled machine that you come to one of our phenomenal colleges, and then you go right from there into the workforce. And what this means is that industry is not yet really bleeding for talent, right? And so when you look at cities that have dealt with a real workforce crisis, they have a much more sophisticated mechanism for making sure that everyone is included in the workforce. We don't have that because industry is not yet bleeding. We have a very, uh, what am I trying to say here? We have a well-oiled machine. Um, and so if you don't have access to that particular track, you're going to be left out. If you grow up here in Boston and you don't have access to MIT, Harvard, Tufts, BUBC, people are just not going to look at you. And so that leads to a dichotomy of those who come from away and go through our colleges and have access to a specific type of workforce and those who are born here and ironically have a diminished access to those same high growth careers. You know, it's interesting about that uh, and my recent experience in politics is uh, discovering how much uh, mayors and other leaders think about trying to hang on to as many people as possible who have come through those four year uh, colleges. In other words, they, don't, they almost look at the problem as the reverse, uh, that there are too many people who come through and then move out. Uh, including people of color who come from other parts, decide that Boston is not the most um, welcoming community that they could find, and then leave. So if anything, and I don't think this is necessarily to the exclusion of other efforts, but if anything, people are asking how can we keep more of those folks rather than perhaps looking and saying, well, we have an abundance of people coming through the Boston public school systems and other school systems who we should also be looking to rather than saying, well, they didn't get the education we would have wanted and they're gonna have to look for other, another kind of future. Uh, this, this is something that 
I don't feel has come together in the policy discussion. Have you had experience of that? Yeah, I would agree that this hasn't quite gelled. Um, I, if you think about this issue in terms of four quadrants of four different profiles of institution, right? They have historically worked together in the past and are not yet really anymore. Mm -hmm. And by those four quadrants, I mean the actual workforce, uh, educational institutions, um, policymakers, and employers. Mm -hmm. Ideally, in any community, those four groups of people or those four institutions are working together to make sure that people can grow up here, go to school here, and work here. Mm -hmm. There is a complete lack of communication and coordination among those four bodies mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I think part of it probably has to do with the well-oiled machine that I mentioned earlier. Um, but I think it's time to revisit those relationships. I think a part of that is in the way that we relate to our employers. Like maybe it's time for our employers to also buy in a little bit mm -hmm. and take a little bit of ownership over uh, not just more inclusionary hiring practices, but also the continued professional and educational development of their workforce. 